Welcome to Cornerstone Online. We are excited you decided to join us today. We would like to thank you for your continued generosity during this time. To give online, download the Give Plus app or follow the Give Online link on our website. Thanks again for listening today. We hope to see you again. Do you know any normal people? I have a suspicion that if we think we know some normal people, it's just that we don't know them well enough to know what their weaknesses are. Because I believe that everybody has weaknesses, we have problems, we have those kinds of things that are called thorns in the flesh. And it isn't that we just go around talking about all that time. I mean, if you're trying to get into a relationship or if you're just making friends or if you are applying for a job, you don't just automatically talk at length about, oh, I'm, I've got these weaknesses and these problems. I'm messed up in this way or that way. We just don't do that kind of thing. Maybe you heard about the applicant who was interviewing for a job and he started talking. He said, well, I'm, I'm a manager where I work and... In my department, we've had a profit for every quarter for the last five years. I've never had a personnel problem, and I always get superior ratings in all of my evaluations. And the person doing the interview, interview said, wow, that's very impressive. What's your weakness? And the guy said, well, I tend to exaggerate. <laughs> okay, we all know that we have weaknesses, and if we don't have one now, then we're going to probably have one in the future. After all, the Bible says that we are like fragile clay pots. And we just so happen as Christians to have the message, the precious treasure of the message of Jesus Christ and the gospel within us. And Jesus holds us together. So what do we do, though, about our weaknesses, our thorns in the flesh? Paul tells us, in 2 Corinthians chapter, 5, chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And he's been talking about a dream that he had or maybe a vision. He wasn't quite sure if it was in the body or out of the body. But he says he was caught up to the third heaven and he saw things that mere men are not allowed to speak of. He says, because of the extraordinary greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in distresses, in persecutions, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That word that is translated there, thorn, could also just as accurately be translated spear or stake. The idea is it is describing a sharp instrument that caused pain, is lodged deeply and very, very difficult to remove. So the thorn in the flesh that Paul is talking about here, we can't say that it was just a minor annoyance. We can't say that it was just a pain in the neck. No, it was, it was severe. And apparently sometimes it, it kept Paul from being as effective as he would like to be in his ministry. Now, the most common question about this scripture is, okay, what was the thorn in the flesh? What, what was it that was so debilitating for Paul? And the answer is, nobody knows. And a lot of people have speculated about it. And the most common guess is that he had a problem with his eyesight. When Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, Paul was blind, blinded by the light. And then when Ananias healed him, it says in the scripture that something like scales fell off of his eyes. And we know from Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, that he dictated his letters. And in fact, apparently he picked up the pen at one point at the end of the letter. And, and he says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And then also in Galatians, Paul says, if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. And some people think that 
Paul's thorn was just he was exceedingly ugly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he makes a reference to some criticism about him that his critics were making, and he says that they said his letters are weighty, but his bodily appearance is weak. All right, what do you expect? I mean, the guy was was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was whipped, and I mean, he, he just, he was stoned to death, left, left to die. Actually, he didn't die, but he, they thought he was dead. So, I mean, yeah, he's, he's going to be bent over. From five times they beat him with, the, with rods, and that was a torture that was intended to fracture the spine or, or cause damage so that you would walk bent over and crippled. So, yeah, he probably walked bent over and he probably had a lot of scars. He, he could be talking about a recurring temptation or opposition from enemies, even spiritual pride, grief caused by his fellow Jews not accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, or depression or severe headaches. He could be thinking about all the memories that haunt him from when he persecuted Christians. It's probably good that nobody really knows for sure what his thorn was, because while he doesn't deny it, He's very upfront about it. Still, he doesn't say what it is. He he leaves it vague enough that I think people can identify with it. No matter what their thorn, your or anybody else's thorn is, or weakness, or problem, or handicap, or crippling effect that you might have in your life, mental or physical, in whatever way, I think a lot of Christians have found some comfort in knowing that Paul struggled in some way, maybe like them as well. Paul talks in verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. He's talking about himself. That's a Greco-Roman style of oratory that was popular at that time. So people say, well, what is the third heaven? What is he talking about there? Well, in Hebrew cosmology, the word heaven and the word sky mean the same thing. And the first sky, the, or the first heaven, that's where the birds are. That's where the clouds are. The second heaven, that's where the planets are. That's where the sun and moon and stars are. And then the third sky, or the third heaven, that's where they believe that God lived. Now, there is a lot here in this passage that's very, very helpful. Some of it we don't understand at first glance, but here's some things that we can take away. Number one would be, it isn't wrong to ask God to take away the thorn. Whatever the thorn is, whatever weakness or problem that you have in your life, whether you need a physical healing or, or you have a, a mental illness of some kind, it is not wrong to ask God to take that thorn away. I mean, you have here the example of Paul. He prayed and asked God three times to take away this thorn. And you might remember that somebody else that we're very familiar with Jesus Christ himself prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane for God to remove this cup of suffering, talking about going to the cross. Three times he prayed, and three times he understood that it was God's will for him to go to the cross and thereby save all who would put their faith and their trust in him. So, yeah, it's, it's something that we do. We have a problem. We have pressure. We have something that's put us in the pressure cooker of life, and we pray, and we ask God to take away the thing, whatever it is. And I'll tell you what, if I ever land in the hospital and you come to pray for me, I I would really appreciate it if you didn't start out your prayer by saying something like, well, God, if you want Tim to really suffer, then bring it on. Or, well, God, if you just want to take Tim home right away, then just take him away. Okay, don't start out that way. That may be how it ends up, but at least start out asking for God to heal me, okay? Because we don't want to usher people into glory in our prayers when, in fact, we ought to be praying that God will heal them because God does heal people. Probably all of us have prayed for a miracle from God. And oftentimes we're sure, we're just absolutely sure that God is going to answer our our prayer exactly the way we want it. But in fact, many times, God doesn't answer it in exactly the way we want it. He answers it. For sure, he hears our prayers. 
and he answers our prayers. But sometimes we get disappointed, don't we? That God didn't answer our prayer the way we wanted it to be answered. And, and you might even have thoughts like, well, maybe God was just too busy to care about me. Maybe he was so busy giving people parking places and helping people win a baseball game and getting people better weather, like rain if they wanted it or not rain if they didn't want it. Maybe he was just too busy doing these other things to care about me and my problems. Maybe you've had thoughts like that before. Well, God answered Paul's prayer. He's going to answer your prayer, but he's going to do it from his perspective with what is beneficial for you and the kingdom of God in the long haul, in your entire life. Second thing that we can take away from this passage is we need to see that the thorn is an opportunity. According to Paul, disabilities, disabilities don't disqualify us. In fact, when we own our weaknesses, whatever our problems, our thorns might be, then God can turn those weaknesses into strengths. He can use those for helping other people in our ministry. Weaknesses keep us dependent on Christ. Weaknesses cause us to call out to God. And, and through that, God shines brightly through our life in ways that, that he wouldn't if, if we were healthy and strong. Now, probably all of us have said those two words, if only. If only I didn't have this handicap, if only I didn't have this weakness, if only I didn't have this thorn in the flesh, then I could do more, I could be more for the Lord. If only I could see, if only I could hear, if only I wasn't crippled, if only I had more talent, if only I had more money, if only I wasn't so ugly, if only I had more education, if only I had more opportunities, if only I had more self-confidence. Isn't it true, though? that sometimes the stories of courage in the face of problems and pressures are more inspiring than the stories of somebody who did a good thing but never had a problem, never had a challenge, everything went their way, everything fell in line, it was just easy peasy. You know, what is, what is the more inspiring story? What is the one that encourages the most? Our hurts, our weaknesses, our opportunities for God to display his greatness and his power and accomplish things that is plain to see that we could never do it on our own. And then third, we see, we see the strength that's in our weakness. The very thing that the devil throws at you to tempt you and hurt you and try to cause you to fall, God can use that to strengthen you and show his strength through you. Now, all sorts of things, bad things, are going to happen in this fallen, cursed world that we live in. Bad things, thorns are going to happen to you. A thorn happened to Paul. He called it a messenger from Satan. Paul said, God, please take it away. And God said, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to use this thorn to help you and to help other people. And, and Paul said, but I don't want the thorn. And maybe Paul even thought things like, well, how come I have to have a thorn, and Peter doesn't have a thorn, John doesn't have a thorn. Why, why do they get to have a healthy body? Why do they get to have an easy ministry? I mean, not that they did, but why, why me? Okay, why me? And God comes back and he says, hey, you, you, you're remembering that I have saved you, right? You're remembering that. You're remembering that I extended my grace to you, that through Jesus Christ I have erased all of your sins. You're remembering that now, aren't you? And my grace is sufficient for you and for any other person. What I'm doing for you through my grace outshines everything. And actually, I'm able to do more in your life with the thorn than without the thorn. Think of it like this. Nobody deserves salvation. Nobody is good enough and has done good, so many good things that they can earn their way into heaven because they're so wonderful. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. 
None of us deserves to heaven. And the only way we're going to get there is through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That's it. When God sent Jesus Christ to this world, he was solving our biggest problem, and that was our sin problem. And he solved it through Jesus Christ. So we got to get our perspective right here. God has saved us, and every other need, every other problem that we have pales in significance to this marvelous thing that God has done for us by saving us for eternity. But sometimes we take God and his grace for granted, don't we? Yeah, I know God saved me, but what has he done for me lately? And this passage helps us to put things back into perspective. And Paul's attitude then, I mean, his whole attitude changes. It's remarkable. So in the latter part of verse 9, he says, okay, basically, if, if you can do more in my life with the thorn than without the thorn, then I'm just going to brag like crazy about my thorn. I, I am going to see the value of this thorn because I'm going to see that when I am weak, then I am strong because I have your strength working within me. And we all, we all have a lot to learn about weaknesses, don't we? We don't want to be weak. Nobody wants to be weak. But it's only when we're weak that Christ's strength can come in and make up the difference, and not only make up the difference, but go way beyond what we could have with our earthly power, you know, if we tried to do it all alone. You know, in our trials, in our sufferings, with thorns in our flesh, we turn to God, and he does so much more than we ever could have on our own. So Paul teaches us here that every time he thinks about this thorn in his flesh, he remembers that he is the recipient of God's grace, and he is on his way to heaven where he'll live for eternity because of what God has done for him. Bottom line, ask yourself this question. How many heroes in our faith had an easy life. You know, was it easy when Daniel went into the lion's den? Was it easy when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had, were thrown into the fiery furnace? You know, was it easy when Paul was shipwrecked? What, was it easy when one thing after another came down to hurt and harm and maim and torture Christians? Was that when it was easy for them? I mean, what did Jesus actually say to his followers? Come and follow me, and you're going to have an easy life. Come and follow me, and you're going to have a wonderful house, a really cool car, a beautiful spouse, perfect children, and an easy day every single day of your life. No, he didn't say that. He said, come and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me every day. And you will have an abundant life. You will have fellowship with me and with the Father, you will have meaning and purpose in your life for eternity. And at the same time, just as surely as the sparks fly upward, you will have trouble in this life. Come and follow me. And people followed Jesus by the hundreds and the thousands and the millions. Will you follow Jesus? Will you allow him to be strength in your weakness? Will you allow him to do more with you and your thorn than you could have done, ever done without that thorn? Your obedience and your love and your faithfulness in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for the amazing testimony of those who have thorns. And in the midst of those thorns, they become a great witness and a testimony for those who are struggling or hurting or have some kind of problem in their life. And it means so much when we see people praising you and thanking you, even in the midst of the troubles and the thorns of this life. And so, God, we thank you and we praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.